But, oops. Um, I you know, read the script um, a couple of times and um, uh, seeing it actually, you know, real like this is like absolutely amazing. Thank you, Angie, so, so much. And, and also all, all the people from around the country that you brought in, the background that you created, um, how they were able to get the, the Russian R, you know, that's right. I mean, um, there was so much that uh, the narrator, you know, in between, uh, I just, I loved what he, what, what he did um, personally. And um, so we're gonna open it up for your, your questions. There's a lot more that I, I, I would comment on, but um, how about, uh, I, who is monitoring the questions? We, you can put a question Hello. in the chat. Uh, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Angelique. Oh, I'm sorry. And Howard, um, raise your hand. Howard Eisner, the writer, our author. Wow. Our author, there's Howard. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, we who just else do we need to everyone? introduce? We're asking everyone to put their questions in the chat box, and then we'll be able to pick a, a few, as many questions as we can within the small amount of time we have to answer them. So if you can please put your questions in the chat box, it would be really great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Howard, I, I have a question. This is the first time you actually seen it uh, since uh, um, you know we've been rehearsing and doing the show. Tell us what you thought. Well, I was very pleased that uh, you brought these particular actors uh, uh, into the uh, fray. I think they did a really, really good job and uh, especially impressed by the fact that you had background uh, for for each scene, which I didn't expect, but definitely added to the uh, believability of the entire uh, play. So thank you for doing that. You did a great job, Angie. Thank you. Thank you. So here's a question from David uh, Cohen. Uh, Howard, what what led you, you know, to to write this play? What what inspired you? What was your motivation? Well, it came from a particular book that I read at the time, which was actually 25 years ago. Uh, the, um, it was called Blood Accusation, and it was written by uh, Maurice Samuel. And it was uh, a very much a nonfiction, blow-by-blow -blow description of uh, what happened in the, in the blood accusation Mendel Bailey's case. So, um, that's uh, that's how it all began, and it uh, essentially inspired me uh, to sit down and start writing, which I began at the beginning of one month, and by the end of the month, the play had been written. Um, I was also picked up at that time by the Jewish Community Center in Northern Virginia and uh, done as a staged reading at that time on two successive weekends. So I've I've seen it in, in that format before. Um, so basically that was 25 years ago and uh, the play has been resting uh, for a period this period of time. And then uh, Rabbi Schneier became aware of it and uh, happily uh, decided to host uh, this uh, entire event. So thank you very much, David, for doing that. You're welcome. To follow up on, on this question, I, I see Ari, Ari uh, Roth, who in his own right is a wonderful producer, director. I, I, he says, how much, um, let's see, the, I guess the essential question, how much did you draw um, from the, 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 like you read, uh, Ari, maybe you can phrase it. Ari, why don't you unmute yourself? Because after listening to the previous answer to the previous question. Maybe you'd like to frame it yourself. How are you so, motivated? It's, I think it's terrific. It was very well presented, very well acted and very well written. How are you um, motivated to create a counter narrative to what Bernard Malamud did uh, in his recreation in The Fixer? And how were you drawn to whatever exists of actual transcripts? Uh, to recreate what you've done? Well, as I said, the major source and uh, the primary source was the Maurice Samuel book, 
which was extensive. Uh, he did a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I was uh, I was reported that he worked for three years on that book and, and put it all together. I found out only recently about the uh, case of the fixer and that the Bayless family was unhappy with the uh, book, The Fixer, and in fact, the brought suit against uh, um, Bernard Malamud. Right. And uh, I don't know exactly what happened as a result of that, but uh, that was one of the events connected to this. Um, but I think that Maurice Samuel is, uh, was definitely uh, the authoritative source for, uh, for uh, the entire uh, uh, explanation of the, of the Bayless case. So let me just uh, jump in there. Um, so I I, I uh, did some little bit of research myself, and the uh, the story of Mendel Bayless also appeared on Yiddish uh, stage, um, you know, uh, Second Avenue Yiddish Theater. Three uh, different productions uh, devoted to this. Uh, you know, I don't know if people realize that in Yiddish, and uh, also Bayless himself wrote, and when he came to the United States, uh, you know, he. Uh, he lived, he emigrated to then Palestine and then in 1921, I think it was, or in the early 20s, then um, came to the United States. He himself wrote his own uh, own memoir, originally in Yiddish, which I, I, I just recently discovered has also been translated into English. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, with the historicity of the play, oh, there's no doubt about its historicity. Um, you know, there are obviously when, you know, it is a, it is a fiction, um, uh, uh, what's a play, you know, there's, you know, there, because to imagine what people actually said without having actual transcripts, you know, that's not, that's not easy. And, and, and that's, I think what Howard was able to contribute very well to imagine the conversations that took place. We do have records of, uh, uh, you know there are records um, of the from the books and from I, I I haven't read I did see the fixer uh, but I don't have any, it's, that was years ago maybe thirty years ago I saw uh, the movie I didn't read I didn't read the book um, and I didn't read Maurice Samuel so um, so but there are there are records so the historicity is there you know but you know some of the names have changed um, they uh, you know they're you know, so I think that's that's probably the theme is having changed. You know, the theme of anti-Semitism that was just horrific. You know, in in Russia, in the late nineteen and late eighteen hundreds into the early nineteen hundreds, um, you know, and it still continues. In fact, you know that um, the pogroms, you know, that preceded the the Bayless, uh, you know, uh, uh, arrest and trial in the early nineteen. Well, 1905, I think most of us are familiar with the Kishinev programs. There are other numerous programs, uh, dozens, dozens of programs in the late 1800s after the death of uh, Alexander II. And, and then, you know, it, 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 it slowed down, you know, um, before the Bayless, uh, the Bayless incident. Um, other questions, let's see what we have here. Uh, Oh, someone wrote, I've heard this story from my grandparents growing up. Thank you for bringing it to the world to see. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Joe Satka, a member of the Cheder community, um, which is a community that Howard spent a lot of time with, um, has a very nice comment. Um, he talks about uh, changes here. Great work. I remember the reading of uh, at George Mason several years ago. This was a, a forerunner. Um, of the of the play that we saw this evening, uh, this really came to life, and it absolutely did. It really did come to life. How many changes have there been since then? <laughs> you want to try and answer that, Howard? Um, uh, well, um, I'm not sure how to answer that particular question. I am very appreciative of the interest that uh, you've shown, and Angie has. Um, taken it under her wing to uh, direct and produce. Um, mm. And David, uh, you hosting the entire event. Um, but I think that the lessons of um, the Jews at that time um, 
uh, happily have uh, abated a bit since we don't have the pogroms of today, today and we don't have the ritual murder that I've seen, but we have continuing, we have to be on, on guard for these kinds of things uh, with other communities around the world. And if you tune in even to today and you look at various countries, uh, you look at what's going on in uh, Afghanistan and you look at what's going on um, uh, in the um, um, in South America and, and uh, so forth, uh, you find uh, some reasons to believe that uh, there are some horrific um, events uh, and we should be uh, we should take a very hard look at that and try to try to help out. Um, one of the uh, words that come to mind are tikkun olam, which is that it's our obligation and, and our duty to see if we can do something about healing not only our own people but the rest of the world. Thank you, Howard. Um, you know, just in terms of uh, some of the changes um, that have made since the original script, uh, I think what what uh, what we, Angie and I, and perhaps others suggested is the, the idea of a, of a narrator between sections. You say someone to, um, in the original version, you had like um, um, some headlines from like the New York Times or whatever other uh, newspaper. Um, but the idea of having an actual narrator, I think that was something new, is that right? Yeah, I would say so, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And, um, and I think that that helped. He was he was delightful, you know the uh, the narrator. Uh, that helped. I, I, well, I if I can yeah. just jump in, David. I always felt that the narrator was sort of like the Greek chorus in a play, and kind <laughs> of projects what the people you know in the town or the common consensus of what people are feeling or saying, um, and what is happening um, you know, outside of the courtroom. So I really loved the way the narrator was. And, and in some way, I didn't know how to use him first. And then I thought, well, you know, he's a paper boy you know, in a big uh, square and he's selling newspapers. And then therefore it's also the headlines. And because we brought the media in and we brought you know, what was written during that time um, in newspapers. And so somehow it all kind of gelled together beautifully. And of course, the actor, you know, who's playing it, um, Alex, is was just a, a brilliant actor. And I want to say that all of our actors were amazing, both from LA and New York. Um, the casting was very uh, intensive because we needed to pick real people that could translate and really connect re to, to the material, because you have a lot of young actors who don't have experience with this type of you know, material. It's a period piece. Um, and I always love when the younger generation understands, um, you know, the material that we're presenting uh, in the chat box right now from Zoe Jack. She says, what a positive representation of justice that we don't see showcased often in the media. Love the music and the background. My first Zoom play, great job to all, an inspiring story and brilliantly presented. So when you have young, you know, generation, the, young, the younger generation make comments like that and they take, a, you know, have a takeaway from doing something like this, I think our job, you know, is done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone, uh, is it Deborah, asked a question about the origin of the blood libel myth. Um, well, my understanding is that this, uh, it's a pretty old myth that you find in some of the cults going way back. These are uh, pagan cults um, where uh, that perhaps, you know, did use um, blood or, you know, there were human sacrifices, you know, in ancient times. So there kind of um, there is a sense that I know blood, you know, blood was used, or the blood libel accusation has its origin much earlier, and then uh, was adapted to um, kind of this hatred towards uh, towards Jews, um, and uh, it just was another way of of condemning uh, Jews for for whatever reason. Uh, and you know, anti-Semitism has, uh, even though the term anti-Semitism really didn't come to um, to us until uh, I believe the late 1900s, 
but on uh, the um, I mean the the our our history, you know, has been one where you know where we've been accused of being Christ killers, for example, uh, where Jews have been demonized, you know, throughout history, um, and uh, where we have not, you know, outside of um, you know in the diaspora, have been forced to live in 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 in, in ghettos and have been extremely limited. You know, in um, you know, in how we interacted in society. Now that began to change. You know, for in Western Europe with the Enlightenment. Um, you know, the French Revolution. In Western Europe first, when when the ghetto walls came down and Jews were able to were accepted. You know, um, you know, within that society, uh, that that sense of uh, Enlightenment came later in Eastern Europe. You know, um, the 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 differences between the between Jews and the rest of the population added to um, added to mythologies or added to um, uh, distrust and um, relationships had to do with difference in language, different in dress, difference in dress. You know, it had to do also with uh, socioeconomic, you know, issues, competition for jobs, people. Jews and peasants, and the majority of the people in Eastern Europe, led incredibly, you know, um, poor, poor lives, and uh, they there was competition, and that also, you know, led to um, increased anti-Semitism, um, and uh, you know, and eventually pogroms. Uh, there was sort of a liberalization with Alexander the uh, Second. Um, the uh, he he tried to reform, you know, on Russian society. Well, he was uh, assassinated, and after his assassination, we have a whole a lot of accusations that this was the that the Jews caused this, you know, uh, his assassination and uh, and other other rumors that just came back to the Jews, and you had a series of pogroms, um, you know, uh, erupting then, and and also that's that. Uh, that stimulated the immigration to the United States between 1881 and 1924. Close to two million uh, Jews emigrated, uh, fled, you know, the Russia and, and Romania and, and Poland, and Ukraine, you know, uh, came to the United States. It also spawned the um, Zionist movement, um, the political the Zionism in either its political form or also in other forms. There are different streams of Zionism. You know, and people started making plans and, and, uh, and immigration. The first Aliyah was in the early 1900s. Uh, you had other movements, um, you know, of, of Jews you know, immigrating um, to or making Aliyah to Israel. And you also have the creation of the Bund, the Jewish uh, Workers, Democratic Workers Movement, as a response, you know, to um, to increased uh, Jewish identity. You know, in the uh, that the Jews were different than other peoples. So that created, so the Jews created their own socialist movement. And that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, so I, uh, I hope that helps kind of give a context, you know, historically. Uh, I see a question about Ziploc bags. They didn't have the uh, Ziploc bags, you know, to put evidence in. Uh, must have been some kind of other bag. Uh, what, how do you, anybody want to comment on, you know, the plastic bag? <laughs> 1913. <laughs> hmm. Uh, about that? Um, there must have been some bags, some kind of bag. Howard, do you want to? Uh, is that just a? Uh, well, no, I, I, I noted that uh, David Cohen had a question, um, and he's an old friend. Uh, can you can you address that question? Oh, what? Well, I think this was addressed already. What led Hesh to write the play? Hesh is your Yiddish name. Okay. I think you answered that. Okay. But um, um, all right. So, uh, can you put the story in the political context of the time? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I sort of did that. The political context of the time. Um, well, first, the uh, there was a uh, an event that occurred back in Germany. And uh, that's worth uh, noting in terms of uh, what happened to six million Jews. So, uh, well, that's after. That's, that's after. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, 
I'm trying to see if I missed any questions. If, if anyone would like to um, unmute and maybe offer uh, some other comments. Um, let's see. Hi, Hesh. It was a great job and everyone did a great job. Thank you, David, and everyone for putting this together. Um, my question was not so much about the uh, emigration and the, how the Jews were treated at the time, but in terms of the uh, political ferment that was going on in Russia, there had been the revolution in 1905, and this was only a few years before the final Re Russian revolution. I think there was a uh, establishment of the Duma in 1910. That's why I'm asking if there was how what going against the state in this way. How uh, radical was that? I mean, you say Kaczynski was Kaczynski. What I don't remember his name. His first lawyer was yeah. uh, clearly expressing some revolutionary ideas. Yeah, I think you're referring to the the defense, the initial defense right. investigator, right. attorney, right. Kar, uh, his uh, Krasov or Krasovsky. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. You're right on. He, uh, uh, he, this is a person with incredible integrity and, 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 and wanted to see, obviously, I think he, uh, you know, he's, if he had a political leaning, it was certainly more towards a different kind of government than what, you know, um, what the attorney general was representing, whose acting was, I thought, terrific, by the way. Yeah. I thought he was terrific. Uh, and I also thought, you know, uh, the actor who played Nikolai, you know, Krasovsky, he, he, was, he was really good, and the other defense attorney. And uh, um, I wish we, they could be here to take a bow, Yeah, you know. I was curious about, um how much of the conversations that the attorney general had with the two lawyers, well, with the lawyer, the defense lawyer, and then his colleague, the prosecuting attorney, how, how much of that did you um, invent? And how much of it was based on any kind of, I wouldn't imagine that they had records of those kinds of conversations, but what, um, how much of that was in your head and how much of that do you think really happened? Well, my recollection of it, this goes back 25 years that I invented all of it. <laughs> <laughs> now there was, uh, uh, I did the reading of the Maurice Samuel book and there was a, there were about five lawyers involved in the defense. And I took note of that. One of them was named Brusenberg, I think. Um, and he himself was a Jew. Um, but um, basically, I took it from the top and invented it all. Okay. Have a wonderful imagination, Hesh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a fictionalized account. And, and, and uh, it definitely was not my intent to try to do a nonfiction version of it. Um, so um, thank you for the good feedback on that. And the other thing was the, the the wonderful pace of the dialogue um, as the intensity of the re re revelation of actually the uh, who was responsible for the murder. There was a, a, a really good sense of how to make that drama communicate to your audience. I like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was certainly uh, my intent to do that, especially bringing Vera uh, into that last scene, um, which uh, which was, of course, uh, sort of a, a voice uh, from from the uh, from the sidelines, so to speak. Um, but uh, the uh, the pace of it, I think, a lot of that. I have to give credit to the actors and uh, uh, ladies who, who put that together. They did a great job with that. So thank you for that. And I have a question for Angie. Um, 
Angie, first of all, let everybody know where you live. I, 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 I mean, I've been trying to get your address because I have something <laughs> to send you. But uh, are you in D.C. or in Baltimore? Because uh, I'm in Baltimore. I actually I was uh, 42 years in L.A. and about three years ago we moved to the East Coast in Baltimore. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I'm based here. Um, I just wanted to say with a previous comment, thank you, because that, that was something that um, we really put our attention to, and I think the music helped. Um, the music of uh, tying the scenes together, also with a narrator. Uh, it was very essential to making that, uh, you know, that tone to become just the stakes become so much higher, the closer we get to the truth. Um, and of course, the actors were amazing in being able to, um, you know, to to translate that. And then, you know, when we took the recorded version of the Zoom session that we did from everybody's house, because we had actors from yeah, Boston, New York, LA, all the way to Maine. Um, um, the editors that came in were able to just cut it at a much faster pace the closer we get to the end to kind of really bring that feeling of we're getting to the truth now. And that, yeah. was, that was the main core of what the story is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a question for Angie. Um, from Joe. Joe, why don't you unmute yourself and, and ask her directly? And while you while you're doing that, so Angie, you, I mean, the, as far as the backdrops and and the the costuming and all that, that's you did that, or did you have some help doing that? Was that your? No, oh, yeah, I picked uh, I picked all the slides in the back just based on the period um, and all the costumes and hair and, um, how they were, you know, had bow ties on and they, you know, men parted their hair in the middle and they, all, most of them all had mustaches. I mean, there's a very distinct way that they dressed back then. So, and, and also the music, we did a lot of research on the music. We had to make sure we had the rights to the music. Otherwise, um, you know, Facebook would have would have not shown our cut. <laughs> they they tag you, and then they you know you have to go back to step one. So we did a lot of research on trying to get everything together. And even though myself, I'm not Jewish, I'm actually originally from Greece. I was born in Greece, and my father immigrated to the United States when I was a teenager. Um, you know, I felt that culture and the feel of it and the de deliciousness of that. Uh, you know, of that culture was, is very much like mine. So, uh, you know, I didn't feel in any way different. And, and I think also this story has a lot more to do, not just about, you know, Jews being prosecuted for who they were, but, you know, it applies so much even today. Um, mm. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Joe, <laughs> Joe, would you like to unmute yourself, Joe Sadka? Uh, he's not uh, no. unmuting. Let me see if I can find his question here. Oh, he said, "What did you What did you read to get a feel for the, this play?" Um, I mean, I read the play. You know, they always say read the play twenty five thousand times, <laughs> and uh, and Howard supplied me with the play and many different versions of the play and a lot of the books. Um, you know, as research that were written about it. Uh, one thing that I was really amazed was that a lot of the evidence of this case are actually in the library in, in, in Moscow, I think in the Jewish library in Moscow, I'm not, you know, don't quote me, but there's actual transcriptions of what was going on in, um, in the courtroom. So, you know, uh, the books that were originally written are very good uh, resources to just get a feel of the period and what was going on. So I read a lot of the material that Howard gave me and just research that I did on my own. Well, right. Thank you. Ira Weiss uh, mentions that the blood libel myth remains alive in many publications, especially in the Arab world. That's very interesting because um, there many Arab papers, uh, you know, picked up on this case and um, and in, in defense of, uh, of, of, of Bayless, you know, and kind of um, attacking Russia for its anti-Semitism. 
Um, this, and more than two or three publications in the Arab world, you know, at, at the time, um, which I thought, wow, well, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, and of course, that raises another, you know, another subject, you know, because uh, this uh, anti-Semitism and, and human rights, you know, this is something that uh, we are wrestling with very much in this country and also throughout the world and in Israel-Palestine today. Um, here it is the last night of Hanukkah, you know, and, um, you know, we, we celebrate, uh, you know, uh, we celebrate a, a victory in a sense, you know, over an oppressor, uh, those who tried to, um, those who tried to, who, who did uh, suppress and oppress uh, the Jewish people in Judea, 2000, well, more than 2000, about 2,200 years ago. Um, you know, and what does that mean to us today? Uh, Hanukkah, for, for me, as a, as a rabbi, as a, and as a Jewish person, you know, it's, it's not just about me. It's not just about how others, you know, feel about me. It's also how I treat and feel uh, towards others. And, um, uh, and, you know, our community is, is very concerned about, you know, um, human rights in Israel and Palestine. And, uh, you know, and I think more Jews need to be aware of what's going on there. Um, you know, vis-a-vis, uh, because -vis, how can we, as a people that has been victimized, you know, throughout history, you know, um, you know, be in a position where some of our people, you know, are victimizing others. And that's, uh, and this play, you know, kind of drives that home um, for me in a different way. Um, um, David, Ira Weiss has a question. Um, Ira, please, why don't you, Ira, you can uh, you speak. Unmute yourself. Let's hear your voice. Some of us know you. Ah, hi, everyone. Hi, hi Ira. So, um, so yeah, my question was about how much of how, when I first asked the question about how much of this is invented and how much of it is historical. It was really the dialogue I was interested in, in particular the events of the trial. Was it actually factual that the defense attorney discovered the real killer, and was it actually factual that the um, siblings of the dead boy were poisoned, and this was discovered during the trial, because that's the most dramatic thing in the trial. Yeah, well, again, you go back 25 years, the answer to that is yes. Um, these, are, uh, uh, these are actual things that happened during the trial, uh, although the dialogue uh, was uh, invented by yours truly. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Ira, I actually saw and read some of the, um, the like I said, the courtroom um, and, and investigators, things that the investigators had gathered. Um, those are the things that I mentioned are in the library in Moscow. Um, and uh, yes, um, they, the, both of her children were poisoned. So there was implication that maybe she herself did it or her brother um, there was a lot of unanswered questions, but um, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, the Perry, the Perry Mason stuff on TV is all, all written. This is more dramatic than that. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, it really happened, you know. Yeah. yeah. And a lot more. There's so much more that happened that you cannot put everything in a play, in, you know, in an hour and a half play. So there was so much more. Um, but I think it's a very, very good representation. Howard? Fabulous. I just wanted to comment that uh, there were actually 11 scenes that were deleted from the original version of the play <laughs> in order to get it into uh, an hour and two, half to uh, an hour and three quarter version. So there were, there were some uh, dramatic things that occurred between Malaski and his wife, for example, and right. uh, threatening, um, she threatened him and she left him for a while. There was other, other adventures in the play uh, that uh, are part of a longer version of it. All right, right. Ari, you're gonna have to put those back in when you do the production. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we would love to do the production, um, you know, under the right circumstances. So we'll, uh, we'll work towards that. Thank yeah, you. We'll, we'll definitely work toward it and uh, keep thinking about it and uh, talking it through, yeah. Thank you. 
Um, by the way, Ari and, and Angie, do you guys know each other? We I'm don't. I, I'm very impressed with all the care you took in producing this. Oh, thank so you. You're, you're an asset to the region. Oh. And I think this form actually, you know, which is both theatrical and of course, televised, cinematic, what have you, this is an innovative and it, can, it, it makes it economical yeah. as opposed to paying 25 actors to do this. You know, you found something here that can be accessible and replicable and educational. So right. I think, I think yeah. you're onto something. Um, and just really quickly, I also think that this is wonderful as a podcast because you can yes. just listen yes. to it. It's so beautifully, you know, kind of directed with a narrator that it, it, you can hear and follow it as, it as, you know, the old radio shows that were back then um, where they would just do entire performances with their voices. And this can very much live as a podcast. Um, that's something that, you know, we can talk about later, whether, you know, Howard would like to, to have that done. But I, I think it's, it's a wonderful, you know, you, people can walk in the morning and listen to it, you know? Well, uh, someone asked a question about, uh, I think it was Alice, that, that uh, she's concerned uh, what happened to Linda Bayless when he left the courtroom. Was he, you know, was he, how did the crowds outside uh, handle yeah. it? I don't think we know that. It probably wasn't reported in the New York Times. I don't know. I, I do. I did read that, um, you know, he uh, he didn't want to make a big thing. He was invited to speak and he could have become very wealthy, you know, talking about this. And and, and uh, he he chose not to. Uh, he he uh, in what I've read about him is a little more modest than maybe the than the person in the play, you know, seemed to, um, you know, come across. Uh, but he he did emigrate to or made Aliyah to Palestine at the time in the early 1920s and then to the United States. So, and he also had, had family, um, which I, 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 I'm not sure where the, uh, you know, uh, Marie Samuel's book, uh, what, they, what he said about his family, but apparently he had, uh, he was, I don't know if he was divorced or what, but, but he had children and, um, and in fact, uh, yeah, his, uh, someone from his family went went after Bernard Malamud, and you know, for the uh, uh, incorrectness of a number of the presentations in the in the fixer. So I, that's anyway. There's a lot more to pursue, you know. But uh, but again, you know, the essence of the story, you know, is uh, holds really well and certainly speaks speaks to it speaks to me. I think it spoke to many of us this evening and uh, really appreciate everyone. You know. I, uh, I just want to say that we're going to keep the recordings both on Facebook and on YouTube till the end of the month. So please let your friends know, pass on the links. Um, I, we had over a hundred people join us this evening uh, between the two platforms. Um, and uh, we would love for more people to see it. And, and one of the listeners, Deborah, um, mentioned that this would be a great thing to show to schools and um, to children. So yeah, we'll take that under consideration. Mm, well, yeah. Well, well, to be continued. Um, just once again, uh, happy Hanukkah, uh, those of you who are celebrating. If you're even if you're not celebrating Hanukkah. Yeah. Um, by the way, I just have to mention because this, this is you know Greek connection here with Angie. I uh, years ago I'll try to make this short. I was on tour in, in in Europe doing concerts, and my last concert was scheduled to be uh, in Greece. In in um, yeah in Greece. Uh, uh, I forget which city. I think it was Athens. Um, I forget, but if the Jewish community there, and I was in, in Brindisi. You know where Brindisi is in Italy. There's a boat I was supposed to catch from Brindisi that would take me to to Greece, and um, I was uh, I was on tour with uh, the World Union of uh, Jewish Students, and um, I uh, and I wanted to it was it would have been the last night of Hanukkah, you know, in Greece, so um, because you know 
you know, Greece in ancient times, you know, was the Hellen Hellenism, Hellenistic empire that, you know, at that time was the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the imperialist empire, you know, at the time. So I feel, oh, this would be very cool celebrating the Jewish community in, in Greece. So, uh, but the boat was late. The boat was late, couldn't get on the boat. I asked my money back and they wouldn't give me my money back. And, uh, and I, I gave, they called the police, you know, cause I, you know, because I was so insistent that, that I, I, I get my money. And so the police took me to the train and uh, the train, you know, they, they, they said to the conductor, you know, drop this guy off at the, at the at, you know, at the last stop. The last stop was Venice. I got on and in Venice, I went to the, Vene the Venice um, ghetto. Some of you know, might not be familiar with the Venetian ghetto. Raise your hands if you've been there. Um, and, uh, you know, Jews really didn't live there anymore. Uh, a couple of old synagogues there, but I went to the Venetian ghetto because I was feeling kind of bummed out. I was feeling very, very much uh, in the ghetto. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, I heard voices. And so I went, I followed my ear and went, went to this, um, this building uh, where I saw a hundred or more people gathered. The Jews from around outside of Venice, twice a year they come in to celebrate Hanukkah, you know, in, in the ghetto, in the ancient ghetto. This is one of the first ghettos. The uh, Roman ghetto was, I think, the first, the Venetian ghetto was probably the second. And so and I had my guitar with me, and there was this guy up front, Israeli, as it turned out, an Israeli rabbi, you know, trying to get people's attention. No one was listening to him, lift my guitar, and he weighs me up. And I, so I was able to do a, a concert were in, in Venice, the last night of Hanukkah, but I would have been in Greece. So this is being with Angie tonight is like, you know, being- uh, It was meant to be. Meant to be on the last night. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> That's a great story. All right. Anyway. Well, listen, you should probably say good night to everyone. Yes. Uh, Howard again, Yasha Koach, Thank you. Thank you, thank you David, you know, and thank you for hosting. The, you know, the entire event, it would not have happened without you, of course. Well, it wouldn't have happened without Angie. I mean, she is- uh, And Angie, uh, uh, Sam is absolutely true with you. You just picked it up and did some incredible things with it. Yeah, and her name is Angel too, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you I everyone. Wanna, I, I just wanna do one shout, shout out to Evelina Weinstein in Florida, who helped us uh, pronounce all the Russian names on a recording that I sent to the, to the uh, cast. And they had to learn how to pronounce all those difficult Russian names. So I appreciate that she did that. Um, so there were a lot of people that, that put their own little spice in it. So yeah. And thank you, Howard and David. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Likewise, for sure. Right, we'll be in everybody. touch. Thank you all for joining us. Please Good note night. that it's going to be on Facebook and on uh, YouTube till the end of the month. So please tell your friends. Okay, okay great. Bye-bye. To be continued. I'll say Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome.